from the dead. Hey guys, what is up? Welcome back to the channel. This is a uh, new time and date. I can't see who's on. My stats are not uploading probably because I haven't streamed in forever. So this will also be uploaded on the podcast eventually. And then this will also be uploaded as a video, like a pre-recorded video on my YouTube channel in case you guys miss it. Um, Wednesdays, I heard, were the biggest day for podcasts. And even though the Twitch channel doesn't have a ton, ton of views, our podcasts are like getting thousands of downloads. So that's why I decided to go ahead and start um, recording on Wednesdays so that the upload will be ready on Wednesdays on the actual podcast. So today's going to be kind of cool. Um, I haven't been around for a minute, so I'm going to chat about that for a sec. And then I'm also going to bring in my guest, who's actually my mom. Um, my mom is really cool. Um, we're really close. She was like the mom and dad growing up and, uh, she was, she's been there for my whole paranormal journey. But just to let you guys know kind of where I've been, 
life's just been crazy. Um, Kat and I had to be a part of some film festivals and negotiations and stuff for the series. I know I've been kind of quiet on social media and there's always a reason for that. And that's because I'm just constantly like working, trying to get the series going. That's always my um, priority, as you guys know. So we haven't been around because other things have obviously taken priority over everything else. And that's okay. It is what it is. So anyway, I want to um, bring my mom in and we're going to chat. So I, I want to give you guys a heads up. My mom and I sound exactly alike. Um, I know Kat's on right now. I've actually, I think I've had Kat, um, I think my mom has answered my phone before. And Kat was like, didn't know that it wasn't me. She was literally like, oh my God, you and your mom sound exactly alike. We also have very much like the same... Um, sarcastic I guess if you will sort of personality so um welcome to the show my mama mom are you there hello all you little paranormal enthusiasts <laughs> this, is, this is crystal's paramom yeah <laughs> it's actually weird mom that it's taken you this long to get like on like we've talked about doing a stream before right yes and we've never done it, and I don't really know why. I don't know. It just hasn't happened. So my mom, um, growing up as just like a mini backstory, my mom was a single parent, and she raised me. Um, my dad didn't really come back into my life till I was in my teens, and my mom was the mom and the dad of the household, and I was scared to death of her. Um, of course, I wasn't really like a bad kid, right? No, not at all. Yeah, um, I was an only child, and so um, it, my mom and I are just, like, best buds, best friends, like, you know, typical, like, too close where you get on each other's nerves, and it's just the way it yeah. is. <laughs> yeah. So um, we have an interesting story. I actually wrote out, like, kind of an agenda for everybody right here today. Um, so let's talk about um, when I was born. You, you – my mom – is a really awesome storyteller. It's probably where I get it from. So I was born uh, premature and I almost died. And I actually almost, I, I had like my umbilical cord wrapped around my neck. Like there's all kinds of complications that come in when your, your baby is born premature. And like for my mother, I can't imagine what that's like. But essentially I came into this planet with one foot, in this realm and one foot in the other. Do you agree with that statement, Mom? Oh, yeah, yeah. But before we go there, I'd like to give them a little background on your heritage and family. Mm -hmm. um, Crystal's grandmother on my side was Native American of the Cherokee Indians, mm -hmm. and her maiden name was Fishing Hog Bear. Mm -hmm. um, so she's got a lot of spiritual sides on that on that side of the family. And my father died when I was 13. And my grandmother, his mother, she believed in past lives. Um, she also believed in the witch's mark. She had a beauty mark above her lip. Mm -hmm. She always laughed and said it was a witch's mark. Mm -hmm. My sister had the same mark above her lip. Mine is on the side of my nose, and Crystal's is above her lip. Mm -hmm. So we all, all have the mark in that family. And um, my grandmother on my father's side, when her grandparents died, she swore that she saw the body lifting out of the, out of the bed, the spiritual body, mm -hmm. lifting out of the bed and floating. And um, she, was a, she was a strange person. <laughs> well, you, but, you didn't get along with Grandma Sheridan, did I, you? <laughs> I didn't get along with her at all, but yeah. uh, she she's probably where some of this started and with the paranormal with you and also the Cherokee heritage. Right, so it kind of it went were, down the line. My aunt, which we're going to talk about that too, my aunt was really into, she's actually what like started me getting obsessed with paranormal TV was my aunt. And my yeah. aunt was obsessed with witches, and she had witch stuff all over the house, and I remember being little, asking her about it, and 
my aunt would say, um, you know, the witch's mark, like, and, and it basically it's a beauty mark above your lip. And, um, so my, like my mom said, my great grandmother had it and then my aunt had it. And my aunt would always tell me, you're the only one crystal in the family with the witch's mark. You have it. And I never understood what that meant when I was little. Um, I think what it means as an adult is the other contact and, and communication that I've made just like with the other side in general. I think it's like abilities that get passed on only to certain people because none of my cousins have it. And I have a pretty big family yes. with that. Wait a minute. One of your cousins does have it. Haley. But she, she isn't into, yeah, she yeah. isn't into the paranormal or she's never tapped, tapped, really tapped into it. Right. But um, she's a great beauty like you are. And, yeah, she's uh, she was cool. Haley's uh, she's like decked out. She's my older cousin. I admired her growing up. She's decked out in tattoos from head to toe, literally. Yeah. And she modeled for like Hot Topic and stuff. Um, so she's very like like extreme alternative. I used to look up to my cousin Haley a lot when I was little, and uh, she, she has a beautiful soul too, like you. Uh huh. Very beautiful soul. She doesn't have a mean bone in in her body. Yeah. You know. So, like I say, she just hasn't tapped into it like like you probably have. So, when and I was born, do you want to kind of talk about? Um, yeah. Basically, I, I was thought, born, and I was I was, it, it, I was an emergency case. I wasn't pr- supposed to be born when I was born, which my birthday is May tenth. For those of you that are asking, and uh, mom rushed in, and they basically told you I I wasn't really alive, and I wasn't going to make it right. Yeah, you weren't going to make it. If you did make, you were two months premature. You were only a five pound little sack of potatoes. Mm -hmm. And um, you had the cord wrapped around your neck. And you made me sick in the meantime. And you were in the hospital for two months. Mm -hmm. They said you probably wouldn't make it. And if you did make it, you would be retarded. Mm -hmm. And I said, how will I know? And they said, not until she's like two years old and she starts walking and and talking mm-hmm. so I was I was just consciously always aware of that and waiting for the moment for you to talk and see if you were all right and you were you were a very special child and everywhere we went people gravitated towards you even when you were like one and a half and two so what did the I doctors mean, tell you um they you you always have this famous quote that you say when you tell people the story about me being born and it's when they they finally like revived me and I was breathing and they were like she's fighting to live. What what's the quote you you always say the doctor said at that moment? They said that you just you had a great desire to live and that you were a fighter and that, I mean the nurses used to fight over you in the neko is it neko unit mm-hmm. to hold you and I would go in there. Well, when I could get in there, I was in the hospital for almost a month and a half myself Mm -hmm. um you people would be fighting over holding you and your own grandmother would have to go in there and say that's my granddaughter i want to hold her (laughs) and the nurses just said she's a fighter she doesn't she wants to live and i just kept praying and praying that you were going to live and be be all right instead you turned out to be almost genius which is amazing for such a little puny thing when you were born, but um, <laughs> but you everywhere I would take you in your stroller, even even when I brought you, I had to bring you home on oxygen. I mean, you were just you just fought 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 to live. And, and um, didn't the doctor say think, like she must be important? She must be. She's going to become somebody. Yeah, well, they said she's she's got a reason to be here, and none of us really will will know what it is. But there's a reason she's here, and there's a reason that she's fighting to stay here. Mm-hmm. And uh, heaven forbid, I had no no idea. I wanted you to stay, mm-hmm. but um, you were just you were just something else. I've never seen a little little baby fight like that, you know. So you- I I I got better. At what point did you realize that I was gonna make it, and I was like not? You know, they said I. You, she could be hand, you know, mentally handicapped. She may not live past the age of three. At what point? Well, did you, you talked. You talked very early, mm-hmm. and you and you even spoke in pretty much complete sentences. 
Mm -hmm. Um, walking, you are slow walker. You've always done things cautiously. You've never been totally impulsive. (laughs) I'm the same way. I'm still that way. Everything I do, I'm like, I have to think about it a hundred times first before I do it. You do. And then you lay out a path and then you'll go for it. But Mm -hmm. you were like that in, in walking. And so naturally I was worried that, you know, maybe you weren't going to be able to walk, but as soon as you could talk, man, whew, you never shut up. And <laughs> Thanks, mom. <laughs> it was, it was, it was interesting. And I mean, you even had stories to tell when you started talking. You would yeah. talk about your, Let, let's your talk, wife. Yeah, let's talk about or my husband, like my husband, right? That I was a wife. No, you would talk about you would talk about your wife and your kids. You were the you were apparently the husband in the past. Oh, life. so you think I was the male? I think you were the male, and um, I thought you were going to be a little boy, right. the way you kicked. Yeah, my I mom pregnant. thought I was going to be a boy. She actually had named me, I don't think you were going to actually name me George, right? But you were calling no, me No, but George. I called you George, just right. to be funny. Right. But, uh, no, I was shocked when you turned out to be a little girl. Interesting. <laughs> because I wanted a little girl. They're a little, they're fun to dress up. Of course, I love little boys, too, but right. Um, you just... Um, I don't know. You were an interesting child. Very interesting. People were just, like I say, drawn to you. So talk about mo- talk about when I, st- I did start talking and you had said, like, I you thought I was making stories up because. Yeah, I thought I- you were making stories up and I your father had been around a little bit and I thought maybe he was telling you things to say. Uh-huh. And so I asked him about it. I asked my sister about it. I said, she, she thinks, she says she was on a boat and she drowned and she was, you were a little afraid of water. And I thought maybe they had put a story in your head mm-hmm. and because you hadn't started watching Elvira until you were a little bit older. But, um, I think it was you thinking about your past lives. And I, I do believe that people are people that are born into this world at, <clears throat> first can remember their past lives Mm -hmm. and and I think that's exactly what you were doing because they dwindled a little as you got older and you didn't really remember talking about you know all of that so weird stuff stuff would happen though right like we would drive by I grew up in Colorado I know most of you know that but we would drive by lakes there's tons of lakes and rivers and creeks in Colorado and we would drive by one and every time we drove by one I would be like that looks like when I drowned or whatever yeah, and boats. You were scared of boats. I don't even know if you still are a little bit afraid of boats. I've, Mom, I've never been on a boat to this day. I know you haven't. Yeah. I know. I have no and As soon as you were desire. a little older, I wanted you to take swimming lessons, and I got you swimming lessons so right. that you wouldn't have that fear. And, and by um, the way, I was extremely against swimming lessons. Yeah, and that was funny, too, because your teacher... You went under the water and you didn't come up for a long time and her and I got really afraid and you were just plowing through underwater. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I wasn't really going to go there, mom. But like, so basically, and we were both like, Where is I was, Where is you guys, I was deathly afraid of water. Like I still, I'm afraid of dark water. It's mainly like oceans and stuff like that. Not, and it's not creatures. It's not sharks. It's not, it's drowning. It's drowning, honestly. Yeah. Um, and I've never been on a boat to this day. I've been to the ocean. I just don't go in past my hips. You know what I mean? But um, my mom, when I was little, uh, I my cousins and I would go to uh, the pools, you know, like as a kid. And she's like, you have to learn to swim. Like your cousins can swim and you can't swim. Like you have to learn to swim. And I was so against it. And she put me in swimming lessons. I had a, um, a student teacher in third grade, Miss Knutson. And she um, taught swimming lessons on the side, and I loved Miss Knutson. And when my mom found out about it, she knew that was, like, the only way I was going to, like, be willing to take, you know, swimming lessons. And so I would, I would, you guys, I would cry. The day we had, the day I had to go to swimming lessons, I would just cry and I would beg my mom. I was in third grade. Please don't let me go. Like, I don't want to go. And my mom's like, you're going. I don't care. Like she didn't negotiate. But basically when we started having to like jump and dive, um, in swimming lessons, you progress and I'd have to dive off the edge of the pool to go underwater they, I would, I was, I think as a like third grader, I was 
like, okay, we have to swim really fast and get this over with. And I would literally go underwater and I would torpedo so fast through the water that like the instructors couldn't find me. They literally couldn't catch me. And I was scared to open my eyes underwater. I just had a horrible fear of water. And but anyway, I did learn to swim. So it's fine. Like I finally did it. But my mom was like, I think I think you knew, didn't you, mom, that I was just so afraid of water. Yeah, I did. And I just well, I have to be honest, I don't know how to swim. Right. So I didn't. I didn't want you to have the. I don't have a fear of it. I just never learned. Right. And I. I just wanted you to to get over your fears and go on. You know, right. with with life. So now and let's go back to the past life discussion because there was something else that happened in preschool. I met Sam, and um, you couldn't oh, figure Sam. out why Sam and I had such a deep connection. You think, so Sam was basically my boyfriend slash best friend in preschool. Obviously, you're three and four years old. You don't really know what a boyfriend is. But I would walk around literally calling him my husband. Oh, you guys were so cute. <laughs> and we were like best friends. And we ended up staying friends through life. Um, he He's actually a big part of my book. But was that a, a point where you like she's met this person like they're so little to have such a deep connection like did you were you realizing at that point that it wasn't probably fake with the whole like past life thing that I was talking about no 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 I I believed at that time even when you started talking about past life that you you had some kind of special connection with spirits and different people I firmly believed that then Mm -hmm. and um with Sam I was, Sam was not supposed to live past seven or eight years old. Right. And I liked that you had such a good friend, but I also worried because that would have been very young for you to deal with, you know, a death. Mm -hmm. Although he ended up, he ended up living till he was a lot, a lot older. Right. But, um, he, uh, I thought maybe he was somebody special from your past just because I knew that his time was limited here on this earth, mm-hmm. you know, and that maybe you were put put there to have this special relationship with him. Right. And because it was very, very special. I said, how's your little friend at school? And he'd go, he's not my friend. He's my husband. And I really think you you believed that. Right. And uh, he was he was a beautiful, beautiful soul, too. Yeah, I, he's so. a part of my book, too. Um, by the way, if you haven't been following me on social media, I completed my first book. My first book. It's it's almost ready, guys. Like, it's edited. I'm in the process of formatting it into an ebook format to release it on Amazon. I mean, it's literally there. Over half of it's already been formatted. Just be patient. So I'm hoping, I was hoping to get it done before December 1st, but I'm still working on it. So let's hope the next couple of weeks I'll have it out. But it's completed. It's just a matter of putting it into the ebook format. It's going to be called Ghost Girl Diaries, and this is going to be called The Love Diaries. So this is all the different loves that I've had of my entire life, all the way starting with Sam. So that's kind of a good introduction with him. Um... Okay, so, and Sam, you by also, the way, we were friends, like, at three years old, we went to preschool together, Sam's family moved away, because he was, he had cystic fibrosis, he was very ill, they didn't think he was going to live past seven or eight, maybe uh-huh. 13, he ended up living till he was in his 30s, he has passed since, but we ended up getting connection, um, Sam and I connected when we were in our 20s again, um, because of Facebook, Facebook was available, and we were able to find each other, so once again, How do you separate lives? Like Sam literally moved from Colorado to Missouri and then we were literally infants at three and four years old and we still remembered each other into our 20s and reconnected as friends. Like that is like major soulmate vibes, right? Like how could you remember that person at the age of four, literally? Oh, yeah. So he's in my book. And actually, Sam's a really big part of my paranormal journey too, but that'll be for the next book that comes out. My second book that will drop will be my paranormal story. I needed to do my love life first because it's a big deal. Like my love life, I feel like partially 
defines my journey and, and some of my paranormal journey. Okay, so the next one thing I want to talk about is Aunt Jean. Okay, so I like to call my aunt, my mother, and my grandmother the three musketeers, okay? Those three women are the strongest, most badass bitches I've ever known in my whole life, and they raised me together, okay? So my grandmother was a huge part of my life, my mother was a huge part of my life, and my aunt was a huge part of my life, especially being an only child. I was just very, very connected to the three of them. By the way, this is like my grandmother on my mother's side, so this is my Cherokee heritage where I started to get really connected. So Aunt Jean is my mother's only sister. She sadly passed when I was in my 20s. But when I was young, there was something about Aunt Jean that I just like loved. And um, she, so that we, you know, my mom, Let's. it's not, a shy thing to say that she was a single parent and she, we struggled. So there were some times that we had to move in with Aunt Jean and she had this huge like basement apartment and we lived there. When I was three, we lived with my aunt and my mom ended up finding out that at like three and four in the morning, okay, wait, wait, rewind guys. I am three and four years old and I am awake <laughs> at three and four in the morning my mom is asleep, okay, and I am sneaking upstairs from the basement apartment to go watch Tales from the Crypt and Elvira with my aunt, right? So when you found out I was doing this, you were pissed. Yeah, I was mad at my sister for letting <laughs> you come up and not, you know, making sure you were in bed. Right. And I didn't think that those kind of shows were really appropriate for as little as you were. Right. But you knew the opening lines verbatim. Right. You, you know, these are tales from the dark side. And I was like, oh, my God. And my mom was like, my, I remember you guys having fights. Like, literally, like, my mom was, like, talking to my aunt. And you're, she's like, you cannot let her watch Tales from the Crypt. She's four years old. She's going to have nightmares. And like, so my, I would go upstairs and my aunt would yell at me to go back downstairs. Like, I don't know how I was on this schedule. And I would literally cry because I wanted to watch Tales from the Dark Side. I wanted to watch Tales from the Crypt. I wanted to watch Elvira. And so my aunt would feel bad because like she would tell me no and I would just be bawling because I loved these shows like so dark and twisted for like a four year old. And my yeah, aunt and then would she'd let you stay up. Yeah, and, then... and, <laughs> and then my aunt would let me stay up till like five in the morning watching these like horror movies and shows. And like so my I remember my mom and my aunt like literally my mom's like so mad at my aunt. She's like, you can't do this. Like, what's wrong with you? She's going to have nightmares. And I remember being in the middle of them, like, just begging my mom, like, please, I just want to watch these horror movies with my aunt. And finally, you kind of just like gave up and gave in. Right. Like, finally, you were just yeah. like, whatever. Now, yeah, I just couldn't figure out why you were always so tired the next day <laughs> when I put you to bed like at 8, 8 30, something like that. Right. So, oh, did I ever have <laughs> nightmares? No. <laughs> you never were afraid of the dark or monsters. Or it's so bad. It's so not anything right. Anything like that. It's you know, so I think not that's right. where you get it today. You know, you're just not afraid. Right. I don't, I don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then um, moving on with aunt, my aunt's house. So my aunt owns, my uncle still lives in this house to this day. This house has been in my family's, like, line for literally generations. Like, this house is, like, four or five generations old. And it's been through every, ha every hand, basically. My uncle, who's my aunt's husband, still lives in this house to this day. My aunt has come to me in dreams since she's passed for years. Like, he, and she's like, you have to get that house. You have to get that house. My point of the story is that house is so old. It was built by like a great grandfather. And this house is very haunted. Um, so this is really where like my paranormal started, like my paranormal journey started. Did you ever experience anything in that, in that house? Yeah, yeah, well, I think that a great grandmother still lives there. She she's passed. She's since passed, but 
she was one of the original ones that lived in the basement and then she went on to a nursing home. I used to go visit her all the time. Right. But I think, I don't know how to say this. I think my grandmother was mean to her. And so I think she's still in that house. Right. My grandmother would make her stay in the basement and make her cook for herself when she really wasn't capable. And, so um, some of the examples of things that would happen is, so since it's a very old house, the stairs are abnormally steep from what you would normally see. When I yeah. talk about this basement, like it's a full finished basement. Like there's a kitchen down there and a bathroom. Like it's a full like apartment. And a lot of the family over the years when they would need somewhere to go, they would just go to the, the basement apartment. We've all oh, yeah. had our share of living there. I've even done it in my 20s. So um, as kids when we were growing up, so there's a living room that's very large, and then there's a master bedroom that's also very large, and then there's a kitchenette and a bathroom, and then, like, the laundry room that's down there. And basically, as kids, we would turn... My aunt turned the living room area into, like, a playroom. The master bedroom, we turned into, like, a playroom that was, like... I pretended like I was the teacher, and my cousins were the students, and we did, like, pretend homework... But we would be in there and, like, goofing off because obviously they let us stay in the basement by ourselves, And we would do cartwheels in the basement. And um, we would knock into things. Like, sometimes we'd knock into the television set because you're not supposed to be doing gymnastics in the house. And I remember, <laughs> like, Amber and Caitlin and I, we would be doing gymnastics and you just all of a sudden hear, like, a boom. Like, someone, like, took their fist and, like, hit the wall and it was almost like an adult being like, knock it off. You know what I mean? Like, so we would hear stuff like that happen. We played hide and seek in the basement all the time because there was tons of places to hide down there. And um, I remember sometimes, like, I would almost, like, talk to myself and be like, where is, uh, where should I hide, you know, from my cousins? And just a door would open, like, one of the doors would open by itself. And I know it sounds strange, but, like, I was never afraid of that. Like, I knew it was family, and it was almost like the, like, maybe, like my mom said, our great-grandmother was like, why don't you hide in this closet today? And I would literally go in that closet, and it happened to my cousins, too. And, like, it was weird, because we just, it was just a known fact that the house was haunted. It was never negative. Um, however, over the years, like, I had, I've lived in the basement before, my cousins have moved in sometimes with like their boyfriends or whatever when they're trying to get on their feet and it's interesting because I've never like when I had to live there um, I was in between houses and I was by myself but any of my cousins that moved in with a guy so like a boyfriend or a fiance or even one of my cousins moved in the basement with her husband our family does not like outsiders so those men that stay there end up like having really hard time like not being able to sleep and like literally have like massive paranormal activity happen and they can't deal with it. So it's just really interesting how it affects certain people in that house. But my cousins and I are just kind of like, yeah, it's haunted, whatever, like it's haunted. Um, so another thing going on to like the topic of indigo children and like empath children you figured out I was like an indigo child and an empath at like a very young age. And it started oh, with yes. my love for animals, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or your animals love for you. you know, so would what would I do? Cars. So my aunt has a huge, this house is huge. It's on a huge piece of land. There's tons of trees. My aunt has, um, she always, I grew up with German shepherds that would jump the fence. They would go rescue animals that were like injured or homeless and they would bring, the German shepherds would carry the hurt cats or dogs or whatever back. But there were like injured birds in the yard. So what would I do when I was little, like three, four years old? Oh, you found, you found a bird one time that had died and fallen out of its nest and you put it in your little skirt and picked your skirt up and came inside and said, look I found a birdie and we all freaked out because we knew that it you know it was gone and so we got a box and told you we were going to put it high in the tree so the mama bird could come back and get it and of course my sister buried it later mm -hmm. and you you thought it flew back home to, to mama mm -hmm. but I mean dogs and cats just 
flock to you. Well, yeah, that was like the very first instance I had with animals. And then after that, I would literally just, and I'm like literally guys in grade school, and I would just find homeless animals constantly. Like, or the, like my yeah. mom said, they would find me. And my aunt was really good about taking in homeless animals or injured an- animals, and she'd like nurse them back to health, and then she would release them or find homes for them. And so my, I found my aunt's, like, the last, like, what, 14 of her dogs or something like that? Yeah, I mean, we, we tried to find the owners, and you could never find the owners. And so she ended up just keeping them, and, you know, we would have given them back to the owners if, if we had found them, but um, we just never did. So she, she always had dogs. <laughs> well, and literally, we would be <laughs> driving on the street, like, you'd be driving, and I was a kid, and we would see, like, a dog roaming on, like, the side of the road, we would pull over and my mom would be like, don't run in the street, don't want to get hit. And I would get out of the car and the dog or cat would literally run up to me, right, mom? And jump in the car. Right. Would jump in the car. And one time that happened and a lady came running out of her house. She thought we were dog <laughs> napping. <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm sorry. I said, your dog jumped in the car. Right. And so, you know, she got her dog back, but I never mean, <laughs> con- constantly. They just, they were just drawn to you, just like people were drawn to you. Must have been your empath, though, because you're still like that. Yeah, I would be, like, when I was little, like, weird stuff would happen. My mom told me, not only, like, when I was, like, in my stroller, but, like, I would be walking with you, like, holding your hand down the street. I don't remember this, but you said people would just, like, hand me money. They would hand you money and say go buy her some, give you a dollar and say, go to the bubble gum machine. And I thought, well, she doesn't have any teeth to chew gum right. <laughs> yet. Right. And I'd try to give them their money back and they'd came no, because you were just, you were a beautiful child. I mean, your face was beautiful. You were, you were just beautiful. And you could just tell that, you know, your soul was beautiful and people wanted to be around you. It's amazing, you know. Um, I mean, so let's move on to a little bit more of a darker topic. And this is also one? kind of a part of the book. <laughs> um, Derek. Oh, Derek. So yeah. I had um, a really very close. This is part of my book. Maybe this is kind of like turning into a book promo by accident. Didn't mean to. But um, Derek was one of my best friends in middle school. I'm sorry, elementary school. You... Um, you obviously were probably more aware of what was going on. Like, you knew Derek had kind of a damaged family. We don't need to get into specifics. But no, his but... parents definitely trusted you with him because we were always in the talent show together. And yeah. um, we hung out a lot. And then any we had – my I had a wonderful school when I grew up in elementary school, grade school. And we always were doing um, really extravagant field trips. And my mom was always there. She was always volunteering for the field trips. And Derek always got in your group because they knew he was kind of out of control. Right, Mom? Like, not a lot of... Yeah. Go ahead. And he would mind me always. Mm -hmm. And um, they always put him in my group. Mm -hmm. Of course, I I was room mom for six years, so... right. All, all the kids knew me and loved me and knew I didn't mess around either, you know, so. Right. Well, Derek he, loved uh, you, too. So he was almost like a very yeah. close brother. He was probably like a soulmate connection for sure. That's because I took time with him, you know, where a lot of people blew him off because he was Henri. Right. And, um, but he was really, he was a good kid. Mm-hmm. He was basically a good kid. So. I loved all the kids, though. So he, um. I'm not going to go into the specific story because it's pretty hilarious. It's in my book. But I ran into Derek um, in seventh grade. So my my where we grew up, when we broke off into middle school, we were separated into like three or four different schools for middle school and high school because um, just depend on where you live. Like we kind of where my elementary school was was right on the line of like a county So depending on which side of people lived, we all got split up. It was kind of a shock for most of us because I did have kind of a um, dream book childhood for sure. Um, Very sheltered. Yeah, I was. We were all sheltered. All of us were sheltered. And uh, so when seventh grade started, I hadn't seen Derek. We had like a major like sixth grade commencement 
and that's usually in May for Colorado. And then we started middle school in August. And I ended up running into Derek um, for the, so I hadn't seen Derek since May. In October, we ran into him. You were there that day. You remember that day in the mall, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Um, you were, Derek you was. You were buying underwear. Yeah, that's the story. Don't give it away, Mom. <laughs> Don't give it away. Um, but um, so he ended up telling me he was really depressed and that he wanted to switch schools. And I invited him to come to my school with all of our other friends from elementary school. Derek was one of the ones that got se separated and literally had none of our elementary school friends with him. He was like by himself practically. And... Um, a couple weeks after I saw him, uh, he committed suicide. It was very traumatic for a seventh grader to go through. And uh, what do you remember of that time? Because that was my first death, and that's really what like triggered like my dark fascination with death. What I remembered about that was you and I didn't have a very good car, but we were going to go to the funeral. I'm sorry, I still get emotional about it. Mm-hmm. And um, all these kids, parents, called me and said, can my child ride with you? Because they trusted me again. Uh -huh. And so we, we had the car crammed full of kids, which was probably against the law. <laughs> and we went, we went to the funeral. And ev almost every kid in, in your sixth grade class came, even though they were spread out at different schools. And here little Derek's in his coffin. Mm -hmm. And all of you guys stood up, got, walked together to the co coffin, all of you as a group, like a united front, to say goodbye to Derek. And I was so proud of all of you because you were still only in seventh grade and young. And all of you never sat down for the service. You all wanted to be right there next to Derek. And I just... I was so proud of all of you for, you know, watching over him like that. And he would have been proud to know how much you guys really did love him because he felt like out of place sometimes. But I think that was mainly in his own little head, you know. Um, but you, you guys sent him off with a beautiful goodbye. Right. Yeah, sorry, and, I'm crying too because it's just, that was a lot. So, um, yeah, it was... One of your first experiences of death, which you've had a lot for someone so young, you know. So Derek, uh, Derek hung himself because I know people want to know details. Um, he had a rough home life and uh, his parents were going through a divorce and he was being thrown back and forth and he couldn't deal with it. He also had not gone through his growth spurt like most boys at that age of seventh grade. So his voice hadn't changed. He hadn't gotten taller. And um, he was with a girl. The girl broke up with him saying he was too short. You know, it just kind of like stress compiled on him and he couldn't handle it and he hung himself. And uh, long story short is is that his little sister was three at the time and she found him um this is also in my book so i don't want to give too much away but um derek started coming to me in dreams after that and he has not crossed over still to this day as far as i know um he doesn't want to cross over because he f has enormous guilt because of um, his sister finding him so when this started happening, I fell into a major, major depression at that age because I blamed myself, saying I was the last person that ran into him. He was getting ready to switch schools. He hadn't switched schools, and I basically had a lot of survivor's guilt um, that I had to cope with. That led to me practically flunking out of seventh grade, which I was like a straight-A student before that. And um, the point of this story, though, is Derek still visits me to this day and when he died um that was the trigger for my obsession with the other side uh, and i mean i had already been in love with the other side like obviously you're watching tales from the crypt and and haunted shows and horror films when you're three and four years old like you're clearly have one foot in and one foot out but him dying was the first death and especially at that age 
um, Google had started becoming big at that time. And so I was on the internet constantly researching, like, if Derek's gone, where is he? Where did he go? It, like, if he's coming to me in dreams, how is he crossed over? He's telling me he's not crossed over. You know, like the communication with the other side and learning where someone goes or what the next chapter is, that's what really started my obsession and that's where I got triggered with it. Um, I got a little a little gothy, a little edgy in seventh grade. Um, I got real like antisocial, stop talking to friends. I was also in a severe depression from losing Derek. Um, but that was the big trigger that caused me to get really kind of, I hate to say it, but a little dark, um, like researching the other side and obsessing what happens to someone when they die. And um, I finally kind of, I, I came out of it eventually. Derek actually ended up coming to me in a dream and like telling me I had to stop blaming myself. So the next big sort of um, crossover that I had to deal with that I think is really important to talk about with my mom is my grandmother passed away when I was 15. And um, I don't want to go into too many deets because I don't want my mom to get upset because it's obviously her mother. But I was, my no, mom and I were very end. close to my grandmother. Another very interesting thing that everybody should know is that I don't know if it's our Cherokee heritage and the spiritualism, but we all openly have always talked about death on a non-dark level. So meaning like if tomorrow something were to happen to any of us, we have no regrets. We we talk it out very openly. And grandma was the same way. So my grandma ended up, um, she had hardening of the arteries and she had to go in and get it cleaned out. She ended up getting a botched procedure, which triggered her to have like, she had a stroke and a heart attack in one night. They had to amputate her leg because she had a blood clot in her leg. There was, it just, everything went bad at once that night. So... I just remember a few things really standing out. Before we took Grandma to the hospital, I remember her looking at me in the car saying, what if this is the last time I'm at this house? Do you remember her saying that? Yeah, I do. So I think I she intuitively knew something was going to happen. Um, I think she did too. I think you and I, though, were like, shut up, Grandma. Don't talk like that. Like, don't say that, you know. And then I remember the day before the catastrophe happened, my mom and I, we went up to the hospital every day. We took her food, whatever. I remember, like, being in there with her for a while, and then we decided to leave. And my grandma was, like, she was straight off the res, okay? Like, she was Cherokee. Like, she was off the reservation. And my grandma, I was, like, I love you, grandma. You know, like, I'll see you tomorrow. And I waved, you know? And, like, I remember the last thing she says to me, she looks at me really serious because she could be kind of crusty sometimes. And she was, like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> like, literally, like, that was the last thing she said to me. I, like, I mean, at the time, I remember being, like, traumatized, like, when she passed away the next day, because I was, like, the last thing she she said to me was, yeah, whatever. But, like, as an adult, like, I look back, and I'm, like, that was so grandma. Like, that was just how she well, was. She, she, yeah, she wasn't a real sentimental slob, you know, no. where, where she'd want to carry on and on. This might be the last time, and she just, whatever, bye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when I mean, grandma, this is an interesting thing. I do want to chat about like when she actually passed. So the doctors told us like she's brain dead. Um, she, my grandma was a dancer and to have her leg amputated was like traumatic. Um, she also had lost my mother's father at a very young age. My grandma became a widow like in her thirties and, um, I remember her saying, like, never let me become a vegetable, because that was sort of what happened to my grandpa. He was just stuck on life support right. for a long time. So the day, you know, we had gotten the phone call that she had all this stuff happen in the middle of the night. She had the, the stroke, and she had the blood clot in her leg, and she had a heart attack, and we had to go up to the hospital. I remember my mom saying you know, I don't think she's going to make it out of this one, you know, like without her leg, because she's a dancer, like, I don't think she's going to want to be here. We went in, the doctors gave us the verdict that she was like brain dead. And you walked up to me and you were like, Crystal, you're going to have to do something really hard. And we're going to have to take her off of life support. And I remember you saying to me, you have to tell her to go, or she will stay because of you. Exactly. Exactly. 
And she, her that, life was you. Her life was you. Yeah, I think my grandmother has a lot of grandchildren. A lot. I don't even know how many. And for some reason, I was the chosen one. Um, I I was past all of the Cherokee artifacts that are from the reservation. I feel very, very privileged and very honored that I was the one she entrusted with those ancient, ancient artifacts that have literally been passed down for generations. And um, so my mom told me, you know, she, she educated me, you have to go in the room. She's on life support. This is what she looks like. But you have to sit in there and you have to talk to her and you have to tell her that you love her and you have to tell her she cannot stay, that she has to go. And, and the biggest fear that we had was when you take someone off life support, um, they can last for like months sometimes. Right, mom? Right. Right. And we did Two not want that. Months. We were scared to death. We were like, oh, my God, like we don't want this to go on. Like we need her to go. We don't want her to sit there and suffer. So, um, I had to go in there. It was very hard for a 15 year old to go in and, and talk to my grandma like that. But I knew my mom was right since she was so close with me. I knew that if I didn't tell her to go, she wasn't going to go. Um, so yeah. now the next thing too, I, I wasn't in there when you actually took her off life support cause you wouldn't let me be in there. Right. But you did go in and they said she was brain dead Yet, as they were taking her off life support, what happened when you were talking to her? She was crying tears because I know she didn't want to go. And so I took some Kleenex and wiped her little tears. And I kept those little Kleenex to this day. Mm -hmm. And I told her, Mama, you you have to go. You have to go be with Dad. You, you know, because... On top of having her leg amputated, she would have had to have been on dialysis every day of her life. Mm -hmm. And she was like this little fragile woman. Mm -hmm. And it just, it would have just been way too much for her. And she went dancing every weekend with her little boyfriend and she wouldn't have been able to do that. And I'm just so thankful that, that she did go, even though she didn't want to. Her life would have been very difficult, and it would have been difficult for you to see her like that. Well, she crossed fairly and, quickly, you said, don't you think? Yeah, and I was thankful for that because I didn't want her to linger for a week or two and watch her starve to death. Or you So know. within minutes, you said she was gone? She was gone. What did you so feel? Like, what did you, did you feel her, like, leave the room? Did you sense the energy was gone? Like, what did it feel like when I that just, I just... They had taken her off life support, and I heard her take a big sigh in, in, of breath, and that was it. And and you just knew she was gone after that? I knew she was gone. And, and I'm not I, talking so her, dead, guys. I'm talking like her soul was gone. Her soul was gone. Right. And I said, I said a little prayer over her, and I think I was the only one in the room. I don't think Jeannie was strong enough to come in there either, and I didn't want you to witness it. And I, oh no, Lori was in there with me. Lori, my cousin. Okay. Yeah. She was in there with me, but I mean, she was bawling her head off. So that didn't give me a lot of strength. You know, I was trying to be the strong one and, mm -hmm. um, I knew it was the right, right thing to do. And it was her right time to, to go. Mm -hmm. It was her right time. She was a wonderful little, little woman. You know? She was tiny. My my grandmother was off the res, so but I don't know how what you think of as like Cherokee, but she was she actually went to um, Chicago to Chicago. try to become a fashion designer, and she she's was a beautiful woman. Yeah, she wasn't teeny your typical Indian woman. She was beautiful. My grandma was teeny. She was super teeny. Um, she was like a size three or something. Her whole life, she could eat right. anything and like didn't gain a pound. I don't know. She's jealous. Um, so after that, um, I started. I got dark again <laughs> this is just like crystal's dark journey okay um, well, i think when you're young it's hard to realize death and and try to understand it i don't think i understood it until this last few years right so when you're young it's harder right so um I, I guess I got a little bullied in high school. Uh, I, I guess not a little, a lot. Um, I was not the kind that would want to fight people back when people would want to come for me. I didn't understand why someone would want to, like, pick on me or fight me for no reason. 
I think that's also going back to like being an empath and an indigo child and like people just seeing your light and especially like what I've talked about before is if you have a really big light you're gonna attract the moths too and I did that and my mom would be like go go like fight them back or punch them back and I'd be like no like I can't I don't have the energy for that like I don't have the anger in me to like hit somebody for no reason you know but it was also because I was still kind of like dark and edgy from like Derek dying and from my grandma dying but I high school is when I started doing like the graveyards and the haunted houses stuff I was with a long-term guy named Josiah and um my mom thought I was like I was making really good grades she never questioned anything I did but we would do bad things like break into um graveyards past midnight and we there were a lot of closed down asylums in downtown Denver that you could break into through like windows which honestly looking back is probably dangerous like if there were like druggies in there or like somebody with machete hanging out but yeah that's when I started really getting into like haunted locations was high school um and then I ended up um dating this guy I have an ex-boyfriend from high school after that his name Zach will not talk about him he's probably the worst person I've ever dated in my life <laughs> but <laughs> and my mom hates him by the way he was somebody I went to high school with my mom hates this guy like oh I do too but um he had ghost hunting equipment and um he not a, not really fancy stuff but night vision and stuff and he got me into like actually ghost hunting um, and then, like, moving forward with that was my aunt's death. So I want to talk about Aunt Jean dying. So my aunt had kind of a rough life. She got pregnant at, like, 15. Like, she had a rough life. That bitch crossed over in, like, two seconds. Don't you think, Mom? Like, literally? <laughs> yeah. <She's ready. laughs> I know it's, she like, we, a better life. <laughs> we laugh in dark humor. But that's because, like, my aunt was, like, she was really sick for a while. Uh, really sick. And then she finally, we got the phone call that she died one night. And my mom and I went in the next day after they had taken her. Like, the morgue comes to get him. And my mom and I, we were, like, oh, God. Like, is she going to linger? Do we have to tell her to go? And we walked in and we're like, she's gone. Like, my aunt was, like, done. She was gone, yeah. She was gone. Which her was spirit shocking. was gone. Her body was gone. <laughs> she, she was looking forward to the other side, I think. Oh, <laughs> my God. It's so dark. It's so bad. It's true. <laughs> she was like, I'm done with this planet. This planet is shit. I'm out of here. Um, so I really wish Aunt Jean would have been around for the next big moment in my life. And... And this is where I, like, transformed from, like, I was a cosmetologist, went into um, executive assistant work, and then I was cast for Paranormal Challenge. So She was around, though, Crystal, and you know it. Yeah. She was around. Yeah. She's still around. So Paranormal Challenge happened. I was working. I had this really big job. I was making really good money. I was working for a hospital in Colorado. I was an executive assistant. I would help hire and fire doctors. Um, and I went, I hadn't missed work. And I told my, my boss, I've just been cast for this television show. I have to go to Arizona next week. And my boss says, if you leave, you're fired. And I remember calling you, mom, and I was like crying. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. They're going to fire me. And you were like, Crystal, you cannot miss this opportunity. Mom. Right. Oh. Right. And so you literally told me to quit my job and move home. Yeah. I said, it's their loss. You know, you have to follow your dream and follow your heart. And uh, sometimes the job just isn't worth it. <laughs> No, you know, it wasn't. There's worth it. things that are standing in your way. You just like say you have to follow your dream, you know. So if it wouldn't have been for my mom saying move home, don't worry about money. In fact, my mom ended up paying for that um, most of the trip to Arizona. I wouldn't. Yeah, have I think that. you still owe me for that, don't you? <laughs> Probably, mom. <laughs> Put it on the list. Um, <laughs> So moving forward with that, you started getting more into paranormal when I did, and you went with me to the Stanley Hotel quite a few times. Right. right. So what would happen to you when you'd walk in the Stanley Hotel? 
Um, I couldn't go in that ballroom. Um, it felt like somebody had put both their hands on my head and was pushing down on my body. Like pressure. Just, I've always had extra sensory perception too with things. Mm -hmm. And I, but maybe not quite into it like you. I don't know why. Maybe I have a healthy respect for my own self. No, but it just, certain areas in that hotel, I would get really strange, strange feelings. Mm -hmm. So I would, like, I had to get out of the ballroom. I couldn't go in there. Um, it just, I didn't, I didn't really see anything weird. It's just the sensations I had. Mm -hmm. I had, I had different feelings. Well, I think everybody has different things in paranormal that they feel or, or they're attracted to. Right. And I think my journey's different than yours. You know, yeah, my mom's, of... my mom respects what I do and she has no interest in really thoroughly being a part of it. So I, I reconnected with my dad. He didn't really raise me as a kid. I reconnected him with him in my teens and then in my 20s, um, after Paranormal Challenge, I flew into, my dad owns a home in Tennessee and then um, he decided to come meet me in Kentucky. I was a part of Scarefest one year. Ghost Adventures was there. I had other paranormal friends that were there. And while I was there, I put in a phone call to Wanda Kay, who was the former, um, what do you call it, an intaker, an innkeeper, I guess, of Bobby Mackey's. So I got to do a private investigation slash tour with Wanda. And just for the walkthrough, my dad was really adamant about <laughs> going. Um, I don't know why. I think that I think he had missed a lot in my life and he was trying to like <laughs> I'm sorry I'm laughing. <laughs> it's just funny. Um, I think that he had missed most of my, you know, the first part of my life, and so he was really trying to like be a part of like that part of my life. And my dad did not really believe in paranormal, okay? Um, and so I was not happy that he was so adamant about going to Bobby Mackey's because I had heard really bad things about it. He didn't go on, like, the actual investigation ghost hunt with me. He just went through the walkthrough when I initially had to go meet Wanda Kay to go sign all of the, um, like, releases and paperwork to, like, be there. So my dad went with me and... Uh, my dad's uh, very Republican. Uh, That's he, a good word for it. He's very... You, you'd have to know her dad to understand this. Yeah. Whole thing. Uh, he's his own person. He's a little bit of an Oklahoma person. Yeah, he's yeah. from Oklahoma. He's from the South. His family's from the South. He thinks that ghosts are bullshit. Um and so that's why I was so shocked he wanted to be a part of it. So my dad, uh, we were inside of Bobby Mackey's, and uh, he kept getting tripped. And I remember he called my mom, please don't use the accent right now, mom. Like, I just don't want to use it. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but my dad's like, those damn ghosts kept tripping me in there, like with a very heavy Oklahoma accent, you know? And uh, then we went back to the hotel room that we were staying in, and there was horrifying things happening. I'm pretty sure I got followed home by one of the Italian gangsters from Bobby Mackey's. Um, I had seen a face a few times when I would wake up in the middle of the night. I would see the Italian face. The lights were flashing. And TV the, moved, the TV was moving. It, they had these huge old TVs, um, like the box TVs in this hotel. And uh, my dad and I would try to sleep and like the whole TV would just slide down the thing. And my dad's like, well, damn, I mean, I guess ghosts are real. <laughs> do you, oh, do you remember dear. me calling you at like three in the morning saying there is some massive activity in here and I yeah, don't want to scare dad. Sleep. I think we did the St. Michael prayer and things like that. <laughs> and, so uh, bad. I, uh, I mean, I believed, but it, it, I think it was drawn more to you, and maybe it was drawn to your dad because of the way he was. I don't know. Right. You know? No, I think it was definitely, well, I mean, it didn't care if dad was in there, but the next day my dad calls my mom, and he's like, 
yeah, Jeanette, I guess ghosts are real. <laughs> like, ghosts exist. <laughs> He's like, those damn ghosts kept, kept us up all night. <laughs> like, literally. I know it. I know it. Oh, so bad. Okay, so um, we moved to Vegas in 2015. And then that was when I reacquainted with Zach from Ghost Adventures. And I went down to the hotel, uh, the museum a couple of times. And once the museum opened, you went to the museum with me. Right, right. So do you want to share your intake on what you experienced at the museum? Uh, yeah, well, I didn't experience quite as much as, as you did. I um, found it to be an interesting place. Some things made sense to me and some things didn't. But then, I mean, it's his museum, so... Uh, <laughs> Jeez. What makes you don't like the taxidermy stuff? You don't understand why he has taxidermy animals in there. No, because I don't feel like those spirits are are with us. You know, right? Um, Ed Gaines is it Ed Gain? His room was kind of scary. Ed Gain's room and yeah, the cauldron. Yeah, and I didn't. There's just a few things I, that I didn't get, but I, you know, understood why why they were there. Mm-hmm. Um, what was your favorite room? My favorite room, wow, was probably, uh, I don't know, I liked the clowns, even though they were kind of eerie. Really? You, you know? liked the clown area? Yeah. Wow. But they were, they're eerie. You know, I never had a perspective on clowns like, like I have now. Mm-hmm. After him going to, what is that, Goldfield, what's that hotel? Goldfield. Motel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where they have the clowns, and so I have a different perspective on. Oh, clowns you mean clown that, hotel, the clown motel? Is that what you mean? Yeah, clown mm-hmm. motel. Mm-hmm. But um, my favorite, I don't know. I I also liked the uh, Kevorkian. Yeah, what's that? That room Kevorkian. is not what people expect it to be, is it? Yeah, no, it's not. But I thought it was interesting because we heard so much about it when I was growing up. Right. And um. I don't know if people are familiar with Kevorkian. He's the one that Dr. helped Death. people mm-hmm. pass over. Mm-hmm. And almost like the right to die right. is here in the United States now. Right. Only he was doing it illegally. Right. So, uh, And you got to know. meet Zach's mom, who's a doll. Oh, she's she's a beautiful person, yes. Yeah, very she's, quiet and dainty. She's very psychic, you can tell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so I, did you, I talked to her and visited with her, and I don't know... If that was his stepdad that was out there, it that is. I was yeah, yeah. You with? met his stepdad as well. Well, he's gone now, isn't he? Isn't he passed on now? No, no. That's his real dad. His real dad passed. That's his real dad. You met his stepdad. Yeah, you met his stepdad. Yeah. So we were visiting in the hallway while you were. And you got to meet Zach in passing. <laughs> yeah, I got to meet Zach, and he had his little glasses on, and <laughs> and his little his little collar up on his coat because I think he was afraid everybody was going to stop him. Uh huh. You were you were out getting a reading then I think. Yeah, that was when and, I was working with the their their psychic. Yeah, and then he wanted you to stay, and yet he was on missing persons, so you had to go. Uh, he's so. he's very he's a very important, very very busy person. Yeah, yeah, he thinks. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so no, the he's next really cute. The he's next really thing cute. I want to like, talk about is um, this is the the grand finale. So. My mother um, has had quite a year, which is the reason I'm really excited that she's on here today because there's a couple times we didn't think that you would be here anymore. And Yeah, it wasn't my turn. Once again, (laughs) as morbid as it sounds, but yet very accepting, my mother and I have a very open conversation and communication regarding death, and we always have. It's just how my family is. And, um, so my mom went in for sort of like a routine thing we thought was going to be like, um, like an artery thing. We you know, as you get older, you just have things happen. And when they got in there with her heart surgeon, which thank baby Jesus, she has the best heart surgeon on the West coast. Thank God. Um, yes, yes. they were in there and realized that you needed a triple bypass. Yeah, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to do it again, but it was fun. So my mom actually had two moments where she flatlined. Um, 
when it actually happened, I went and saw her after she was in like the ICU unit. She only, she did tell me about both. So she has um, one story. She doesn't remember one flat line and she, she remembers the second flat line. So do you mind if I share the first one that you don't remember? And then I'll the one, like, the one that I wanted to <laughs> write it down for you. Exactly, yeah. Because the second yeah. one you remember. So she doesn't remember. The, so she flatlined twice. So the first time she flatlined, or it's called coding, she coded. Um, the first time she flatlined was when they were actually doing the heart procedure of a triple bypass. So they have to like disconnect your heart and reconnect it in different ways. I'm not a surgeon or a doctor, so I'm not going to pretend I know what happened. Um, Wait on. And that moment, (laughs) she did tell me when she came out of surgery, she did say that she saw a light, but it wasn't what people think it is. She said that it's like a tunnel, but it's like not like straight, but it's going up at a slight angle. And it's basically like she and, and it was it's been my theory, but basically the light is there to like give you a direction of where you're supposed to go. So like the whole like. The whole joke of like, like go to the light it's, it's like a flashlight like you're sleeping it's it's interesting it's like when you're dreaming so, you're just your consciousness is just there it's like floating kind of i hate to use that word too it's just uh it was interesting i remember everything about that well so I remember, but you said you don't remember them telling you you need to go back no, I don't remember any of that. All I remember is all I remember was thinking, I've got to wake up and tell Crystal what this is like. So the first time she, she coded, she, she needs to know. She was like, "I'm," she said, "I'm going to the light," and then something or someone. Now, once again, she doesn't remember this now. So this was information she gave me when it first happened. She goes, "Something or someone." She said it was either a spirit guide or an angel said. It's not your time. You have to go back. Like, you have to go back. And at the time, my mom was like, well, I don't, how do I go back? Like, I don't know how to go back. How did I even get here to begin with? I don't even know how I'm here. Yeah, and then I didn't all, understand. And then she went, she got back into her body. Now, the second time she coded, which I'll let you tell this story, Mom. Um, but the second time she coded, they had completed the procedure. They closed her up. They send the patient to ICU. And then what ended up happening was the doctors were getting ready to leave the room because the procedure was done, everything's finished. And all of a sudden, my mom coats. And what had happened was, for some reason, because there can be weird, random things happen, her lungs filled with fluid, they don't know why, and she basically drowned. Now, you don't remember the drowning part. No, I don't remember that. They told me there's certain things I'll never remember. Right. And... And then there's certain things that I are so vivid. It's okay. So let's crazy. start. you you say you're in your body and you know you're there, and then all of a sudden it sounds like the doctors are getting further away from you. Yeah, I remember that. And you're yeah. basically you felt like you started to float upwards, almost like their voices were muffled, and it was like a total black room. It was like the sky. It was like. But no stars. It was like, it was just time and space. Like void. It was like a black, dark it was, void. Yeah. It was the strangest thing. So At least you're, I know what, what it'll be like. <laughs> so you're basically like floating and you, you, you said you consciously knew you were dead. Yeah. I knew I was. And then I just thought, I've got to tell Crystal what this is like because she... Because of your paranormal so stuff. So work me through the thought process of what that was like. Like, tell me what you were saying to yourself. Like, what what's I, going on? I was saying to myself, I've got to tell Crystal what this is like. That's exactly what I was saying. I didn't know how. I didn't know where I was. I didn't even care. I didn't even, didn't even think about it. I just knew that I needed to tell you. Mm-hmm. That's probably what brought me back. Mm-hmm. Because I do remember waking up. You were in the room, and I wanted, I couldn't talk, because you said I had tubes and things down me, but uh-huh. Uh-huh. I wanted a pen and a paper to write, <laughs> write all this down, and shoot, I couldn't even. Well, so go back to the, sense. so you're floating, so you're floating, and then, and then what happens after that? Like, what, how do you get back in your body? Do you remember that? I don't that? know. I, I don't know. That was, that's a big blank spot. 
Uh-huh. All I know is the last thing I remembered was I've got to tell Crystal about this. So what's the last thing you remembered was just waking up? Yeah, just waking up. And then when you woke up, did you know you were in your body or did you think you were still crossed yeah, over? Yeah, I knew I was in the hospital and in, in the bed. I didn't know I had tubes down me. Right. I didn't know. I didn't know anything except I needed. To, it was the same thought process as when I was there. I knew I had to write this down for you. So you knew. Why, you so why you woke you up. Let me have peace in my death. So you <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, dark humor, guys. Now you know where I get it from. So you're saying you you floated above your body. You you don't know where you were. It was a dark black void. It was just parallel with my body. It wasn't floating above. You were floating. parallel with your body. So you did you parallel. feel like your like body was below you a little bit though? It was no, I didn't even know if my body was there. It was just, <laughs> it was almost like a head. Like your head. So, so okay, cool. so you're saying it you were it was your consciousness basically. Exactly. Exactly. So it was full consciousness. You could still think <laughs> like you knew what was going on. And then all of a sudden you wake up did, and when you wake up you realize, "All right, I died, crossed over and came back." Is that your thought process? No. No. There was no thought process. It was just, I've got to write this down for Crystal. Period. So it just was what it was. You knew you had died and you knew you were no longer dead. Yeah, I knew I came back. but I And I needed to tell you what it was like. Hmm. I'm sorry it wasn't more exciting or dramatic. No, no, but like this is what I want people to know because people don't know, you know. <laughs> so on that, if we could go into that a little further, you told me specifically, <laughs> death is not scary. I'm sorry, it's my allergies. <clears throat> It wasn't scary. What's it like? <coughs> just it wasn't happy. It just is. <coughs> is is exactly the word. Just mm -hmm. is or was. Okay. And that's it. And that's it. It was not. It was not. It was nothing. It was a big nothing. It was a. It was a big nothing. It's the a big brain fart. <laughs> well, and so it's interesting, yeah. guys. So basically, what ended up happening was she she drowned. Her lungs filled with fluid. She had no idea this was happening. The doctors were getting ready to leave the surgical room when she flatlined. They had to come back in. They gave. They had to resuscitate her. They had to put tubes in her lungs to you know drain out the fluid it just happens with major procedures and she was actually on life support strapped to the bed when i saw her in icu and um she was Sorry. she was yelling at me while she was in icu because she wanted a pen and paper because <laughs> she was so like angry i was like the nurses are like is this how she typically is i was like yeah if she's angry like she's fine like she's like right where she needs to be like this is this is God. who she is she's like she's she's got a tube down her throat she's on life support she's like i need a pen and paper I need a pen and paper. <laughs> like, she's so mad. And so I got her a paper. I got her, like, this notepad and a pen. And, like, she would go to – she's like, I need to write it down. So I'd, I'd hand her, like, I'd hold up the paper, and she'd go to write because she was on life support and, like, killer pain meds. Like, I think she was on morphine. She'd go to write, and she'd just, like, pass out. <laughs> like, literally <laughs> – <laughs> oh my god so then she'd wake up and then she'd jolt and she'd see me and then she'd be like give me the paper give me the paper and i'd hold the paper up and she'd go to write and like she, she was like she looked like she was gonna write a book and all of a sudden she'd be like oh she passed back out again that was weird too do you remember doing that kind of yeah kind of do you? i kind of do so I mean, it's just like, why am I? Tr I'm trying to die. I'm remembering, <laughs> I'm remembering. I have to tell my daughter something. I mean, that's ridiculous. <laughs> oh my god! So she was on life support for a few days because they had to make sure that the her lungs cleared up, obviously, so that she was you know able to like live and carry on. And the nursing <laughs> staff actually asked me to stop coming to the hospital. Because every time I'd walk in the room, she would jolt up and they had her strapped down because, you know, they didn't want her to pull any of the cords out. And so the nursing staff was like, you know, like, we don't want to be rude or, like, mean, but just for a couple of days, is there any way you could, like, not come back to the hospital? <laughs> because every time she sees you, she jolts. So that was really hard. But then when I came back up and she was, like, off of all the tubes and stuff, she was like, I died. And I was like, well, I know. It was actually twice. So she doesn't <laughs> remember the first one. But you were, like, kind of mad at me, I remember, because you were, like, were you upset that I was, like, 
on life support? Like, did you think I was going to make it? And my response was like, I know it sounds weird. And like, I know you're on life support, but like, I just knew you, you weren't going to cross. Like, I just knew you were okay. Yeah. I think you do know. And as close as you and I are, I think that's you know that's probably why we argue all the time we're too close right but i think i think you're just perceptive of another person you know just like i knew grandma it was grandma's turn i knew it was genie's time too right so you know i think you just knew that i wasn't gonna go yet i did you know i i told my surgeons i can't go until my daughter gives me grandkids (laughs) you have fur babies (laughs) So, I have fur babies. Uh, you yeah. have fur grand babies. You have many and fur I grand babies. <laughs> um, so, so I don't know. I didn't even know some of this stuff until I don't know what a week ago when you and I were talking. Yeah, there's things I just didn't even remember. You know. And so it's yeah, like, there's some wow. things my mom doesn't remember, and she talked about it with her surgeon. And there's something called if you code. So she coded twice. There's things even from, like, your childhood and, like, past memories you just don't remember. No, I remember everything. Well, no, the other day we were talking and you were like, I just don't remember some things. Well, but not about my past life. It was just about that time. Oh, about, so it was just within that year or two, like, there's things you can't remember. That time, yeah, because I had, I had uh, five other major surgeries after that. Right. And I mean, it's been a real fun year for. So, and they said that other over. people that code have do the same thing. They have problems remembering things. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm lucky I remembered you. Oh my gosh, mom, you're terrible. <laughs> well, that is it for mom's chat. Um, so, long story short, of crossing over is not scary. No, it's not scary. It is what it is. Of course, I'm. I'm not, you know, it doesn't scare me. I saw my dad suffer so long that um, I actually think it's a beautiful thing when it's your turn. Maybe you're going to miss people that you know and love, but it's, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. And don't be, don't be afraid of it. Right. You know, just don't be afraid of it. I think the worst fear is that you're going to miss your loved ones. Right. But really, you don't know anyway. You don't know. So do you believe in spirit guides and angels and stuff now that you've had this experience? I mean, you did before, but. Yeah, I still do. I still do. And I think that's what gives me the inner strength to know that someday I I have to face this. And, and, you know, why you and I talk about it. Right. Because you know, you know, all my wishes, if anything happens. And um, it is what it is. It just is. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, a lot of people who don't want to die or do want to die or, but I think it's not, it's not always in our hands, except in the case of suicide, which I think is not the right thing to do. Well, I think, I people, think Derek has come to me and said that he's not crossed over and I know he's not. He says he feels guilt over his um, sister, but I, yeah. I don't think you go to hell with that. I just think that you're going to have to come back and do it all over again. Well, yeah, and I believe in reincarnation, and I believe in, uh, you know, that, that you can have more than one life. Mm-hmm. I think some people don't. Right. But, um, you know, you didn't talk about Chris. What, do you want to ch- you want to chat about Christian? Is there a reason? or? No, he's a huge part of my book. Christian is a big part of my, um, Christian, how do I word this? Christian's a part of my YouTube catalysm and, and, and what what YouTube became of. So Christian, um, is also in my book. He is, he was a boyfriend. I've talked about him on my YouTube channel many times before seventh grade, um, eighth grade, ninth grade. And we stayed friends into our twenties, tried to redate again in our twenties. And then he, um, he, it was claimed that he was, he was a suicide um, when I was in my late 20s, um, and that was right before I left and moved to Vegas. And uh, he's come to me in dreams many times telling me that he was murdered by someone, and his family did not investigate it uh, because they had him cremated immediately. Um, I think he was involved with some really 
dark cult people. He was actually living with a group that I would identify as a satanic group. Um, and that's in my book, so you'll be able to read more about that. But my mother adored Christian. He's come to you in dreams, hasn't he, Mom? Oh, yeah. 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 He would have been the kind of son I would have wanted if I'd had a son. Mm -hmm. Henri little shit. And Christian's just, definitely I don't know. Him and I had a special rapport. We yeah. just had a special rapport. Yeah. I, I always got along with the Henri ones, didn't I? <laughs> it's true. But, yeah, Christian, <laughs> so, um, yeah, he's he's a big part of my journey. My mom loved Christian. I think that if I would have married anybody, she would have wished it would have been Christian. Yeah. But yeah, we just were on separate paths, and that's okay. But yeah, Christians come to me a lot. Is there anything else you want to chat about? No, I just was curious why, and I um, um I don't know. I just thank all of you. I, I love him. I've talked about Christian a lot. You know what I mean? And he's in my book, and people will know immediately when they read. He he's actually has two chapters in my book, so he's he's a big oh. part of my journey. I actually left Colorado. Like, within a month after he died, because I knew I couldn't stay in Colorado with him dead. I just had to get away. Like, he'd been a childhood friend, obviously. I'd known him since, like, 13, and I just... Everything reminded me of him, and I had to get away. I had to get out. So, um, then I moved to, to Vegas, and YouTube started, and it just blew up. And that was just kind of it. So, he was definitely the catalyst for YouTube. Christian has definitely crossed over. I don't think it was suicide. But, um... Thanks, Mom, for coming on and chatting. Well, I enjoyed it, and thank all of you for listening to me. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun talking about everybody and uh, learning about what's going on, you know, when it comes to um, the other side and, and understanding yeah. that things are not what they appear to be and that it's not a scary thing, especially my mom's done it twice. Thank you so much, Mom. I'm going to do my outro, so I will uh, – let's let's do dinner here in a little bit. Okay, sweetie. Thanks, Mom. Bye, Love kids. Um, that's my mama. <laughs> She's off now. Um, I've been wanting her to come on for a hot minute, but, you know, having a triple bypass is a major, major surgery, and it's taken a while for her to heal. She's still healing, um, and and that's it. But um, she's, she definitely talked about crossing over twice. When it happened, she coded twice. The first time was really interesting. She doesn't remember talking about the first one. Um, she told me that immediately out of surgery, that she did see a white light, and she was floating towards a white light. And that um, something, and it, I said, was it Grandma? Was it Aunt Jean? You know, like something was telling her to go back. Like, no, you're not, you're not supposed to be here. Like, you need to go back. So that was when they were actually doing the transfer of um, her triple bypass. And the second one, though, she does remember, which is really interesting. So I, another thing I wanted to tell you guys, I, I'm obsessed with TikTok right now. If you haven't gotten on TikTok, you need to follow the hashtags of like paranormal and haunted, haunted houses, all those hashtags. There is um, a couple of people that I've been following that have had like near death experiences. And if you look in the comment section when they share their near death experience, Everyone in the comment section that survived has the same story my mom does, which is they were like floating in like a black abyss and it was just nothing and they knew they were dead, but like couldn't figure out if they should go back to their body. How did they go back to their body? A lot of people were panicked saying like, um, if I'm floating in the black abyss, what if I don't see the light? Does that mean I don't cross over? I don't, I don't know what that means. In my opinion, I'm wondering if, like, your guides haven't stepped in yet to, like, help you one way or another. Or, like, some of these people in the comment section were having, um, they had drug overdoses. And they died and said that, like, oh, I all of a sudden, like, I knew I, um, I overdid it on heroin or whatever. And then I was floating in this black abyss. And then, like, all of a sudden I woke up and I was, like, it's when like the paramedics give them like the injection or whatever and they wake up and they don't remember the in-between phase of like how they got back into their body they just like abruptly wake up in their body so I just thought it was really interesting that that story matches hundreds of people literally on TikTok that are talking about the same experience that survived so it's almost like you're in limbo like waiting to come back um part of you know my YouTube career I've talked about the gray zone that's what I call 
spirits or souls that are like stuck on earth that haven't crossed over but aren't alive that's something that Derek actually told me in my dreams that it everything looks gray everything he sees looks gray nothing is in color and he is choosing to stay on this plane and not cross over um that's a really big chapter, so I hope that you guys like that. Um, I will do an announcement on YouTube when my book is ready and when I have released it so that you know, because I know a lot of people have been messaging me on like all social media, like, I want to buy it. I think that for the sake of just being lucky, like good numbers, I think because it's a soulmate book, I'm going to release it for $11.11. .11 which is the twin flame sign is 1111 because I talk about my twin flame in there too. That is going to have to be a book by itself though. So it will be released. I actually found out that I can release it on Amazon for on-demand print. So if you want it on print, they'll be able to um, print it for you and order it that way. But anyway, thank you guys so much for tuning in. That concludes this stream. I will be uploading this as a video to my um, YouTube channel. I will be doing new YouTube content. Things have just been crazy. The series is still going. Negotiations have been taking place. Everything takes time. Also, hashtag we're in a you know pandemic quarantine. It is what it is. I hope you guys are staying safe. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, next week, Kat will be here with me. So Wednesdays at 3 p.m. PST is our new streaming time. And uh, check us out on social media. Make sure you're following us. Please make sure you like and subscribe. And as always, I will catch you guys next time. Back from the dead. Ladies and gentlemen, you're all invited to go fucking mental on this motherfucking drop. The countdown has just begun.